Thank you very much for hosting me. Okay, so I'm going to give an overview of the water quality training program in the Ohio River Basin, and um, and I'll kind of start from the beginning as far as what is water quality trading, but then go pretty rapidly towards um, deeper dive details on how the program is set up and some of the rules that we have in place. Um, so by the end of the webcast, you should not only sort of have an overview of what water quality trading is, um, but also have the background about how we built this program and then uh, all the way to what the credits actually represent. All right, let's see here if I can advance my slides. There we go. Um, okay, so the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI, um, is an independent nonprofit research organization. I've been at EPRI, this is my 14th year, um, and that entire time has been focused on uh, looking at environmental markets and trying to make the business case for having uh, uh, corporations make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis that protect the long-term viability of ecosystems. So I'm an ecologist by training, um, but there's, I, I see the clear need to have to connect the dots between ecology and, um, and boardroom decision-making about what companies need to be doing today. So that's kind of the nexus that I work in generally. Um, EPRI, although our members um, are primarily from the electric power industry, we are an independent organization. Um, and we bring together scientists and engineers, um, agencies and states to form collaborative research that sort of helps address the challenges generally about electricity. And uh, we do anything that touches on electricity from generation of power all the way to power at the plug and how electricity is used by users. So that can cover a pretty broad set of possible research areas that, that we conduct research on. This particular project that I'm speaking to you about today, our water quality trading project, um, just received the United States Water Prize. Um, this is, um, we're extremely humbled and honored to receive this, pro this water prize. Um, it recognizes um, institutions or projects that have made outstanding achievements in the advancement of sustainable solutions to our national water challenges. Um, and I will be going to Washington, D.C. next month to accept the award on behalf of the project team. Um, so just to kind of ramp up on what water quality trading is, um, in our project and, and a lot of water quality trading programs, they work with non-point sources. Um, typically, it's farmers. So a farmer can install a best management practice that is known to reduce um, pollution to waterways. And the primary pollutants that we look at at this point are nitrogen and phosphorus. Can also set up credits for sediment um, or temperature. Uh, so these are different types of, of credit types that you can generate from BMPs on farms or riparian areas. When the credit is generated um, on the other side, on the right-hand side, you will have somebody that needs to use that credit for, for permit compliance obligations. So for example, Typically, it's an NPDES permit. So point sources will have discharge permits. And they can, they can install technology at, at their plants or at their wastewater treatment plants. Um, certainly, water quality trading is just another tool in the toolbox that they can use to meet their discharge permit limits. So they pay for these credits. Um, they receive the same or better uh, nutrient reduction um, uh, out, uh, outcomes. And overall, this system allows for those nutrient reductions to occur at a lower cost because if you install a technology at your power plant or your wastewater treatment plant, um, it can be quite costly, um, anywhere from $50 per pound of nitrogen to $150 per pound of nitrogen. Typically, credits from a water quality trading program can range in an annual credit anywhere from $5 to $10 to $15. Once in a while you hear of a, a credit that's as low as a dollar per pound. So the business case to, um, to consider water quality trading as a compliance option is, is pretty um, outstanding. And now we're looking at 
and we also sell these credits not only for compliance obligations, but also to meet broader sustainability stewardship goals of companies that have impacts in the Ohio River Basin or maybe buying corn or milk or soybeans from the Ohio River Basin and would like to offset supply chain impacts on a voluntary basis. So we're testing both selling the credits for permit obligations as well as for voluntary sustainability buyers. So our focus in this pilot is really the question of can water quality trading be socially, ecologically, and economically viable? I don't have an answer for this yet. Uh, we're in a very long process of doing a pilot project, which is really the best way to kind of jump over theoretical debates about water quality trading and market mechanisms and so forth. So we wanted to actually execute a pilot project um, we do not uh, say that water quality trading is, is the only way to achieve um, uh, sustainability. In fact, we know that it's, it's going to be one part of a very big set of tools to manage water in the United States. Um, but so far, we can confirm that when a trading program is set up appropriately and diligently, it can be ecologically valid that the credits that we're transacting in our program, I personally can stand behind these credits as an ecologist and a scientist, um, and I know that the credits are real and valid. Socially, I know that this program is working, um, that we have moved private money that we have raised at EPRI all the way to the landowner and the farmer. And economically, that's, that's the question where we have to check the box on in the next couple years is that now that we've built a program that is sound from an ecological standpoint and socially, can we sell the credits at enough quantity and price to maintain the economic viability of this program? So that's the box that's not checked, and I'll, I'll get into more detail on that in a few more slides. So this is a whole picture of the entire Ohio River Basin. Right now, we're working in the three states of Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky. The different colors on this map show the different um, Huck 4 watersheds. Huck 4 is a pretty big watershed, um, and that's where we're kind of looking at to structure these trades around, and we have a full watershed model that's calibrated at the Huck 4 level. When you look at the Huck 4, you see that these watersheds cross state lines. And that was um, the science and the functionality of these watersheds has really driven the majority of decisions on the program. Um, and because these watersheds crossed state lines, we knew that we really wanted to work on an interstate basis, um, not because we wanted so many agencies to work with, but simply because we know that that's what the watersheds dictate. They dictate that we work across state lines to address water quality collaboratively. So that's what we've been doing on this project. Right now we have contracts with um, over a little over 60 farmers. Um, we can document uh, over 150,000 pounds of nitrogen, total nitrogen, total phosphorus, which is we've almost doubled the original goals um, during the pilot period on pounds. Um, still, it's not a lot, and that's why we're doing a pilot period. Um, we have a number of documents that sort of set up a, a um, governance platform for this project. Um, ORSANCO, which is the Ohio River Valley Water Sanitation Commission, um, and has uh, authority over managing the main stem of the Ohio River, uh, passed a resolution in support of the project with the support of their participating states, and those states are listed on that first line there. So we have a resolution passed with Orsenko. Nehruk, um also uh, passed a resolution to recognize this project. And it says it commends EPRI for working to develop best practices in water quality trading. And they encourage state governments to consider similar programs given the importance of water quality to the nation. So recognition from Nehruk. And then more functionally, we have uh, project letters. So um, from United States EPA, from EPA in Regions 4 and 5, from USDA, 
Um, some of these letters are just to express support and recognition for the program. Some of the letters actually help us to define the rules of the program, and all of these are posted to our website. We have a, a strong commitment to transparency, and we work to put as much as we can posted on the website um, as possible. <clears throat> there is a strong set of core um, project collaborators that's listed there that's kind of our our technical team and some of the early funders that came into the program, like um, EPA and USDA, um, American Electric Power, Duke Energy, and others, um, working obviously closely with the states of Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky. And in those states, it's both the ag side, so the ag agencies, as well as the permit side. Um, and then we have um, four external advisory groups, including the electric power industry, um, environmental groups, wastewater treatment plants, and agriculture. And because we're EPRI and we work closely with the electric power industry to sort of identify research needs, it was um, some of those early power companies who said, let's, let's do a research project in water quality trading and, um, and see if there's viability here to use trading as a cost-effective compliance option. So American Electric Power, Duke Energy, TVA, Hoosier Energy were all kind of some of the early folks that came to the table and said, let's do a project together. Um, this is more detail on some of our external advisory committees. We've gone, gone out in the field, done field days and things like that to get boots on the ground. Um, what functionally really allowed us to move forward uh, with the program was a signed trading plan. So this is a photo of, of um, the six um, individuals from the three state agencies, so ag side and permit side, who signed on to the trading plan. And when this happened, this marks the first uh, water quality trading program that had been approved by multiple state agencies. So meaning that these states are coming together to collaborate to make sure that this program um, can transact credits and um, and also trade credits across state lines. Uh, our farmers are, you know, the heart of the project. They're the ones that get these projects installed on the ground um, and and generate the credits. Um, we provide 75% cost share to the landowners. Um, and we do an RFP when we have funding available to these to these landowners. The RFP goes through the county soil and water conservation districts through our collaboration. And um, and a lot of times these landowners will be there's different reasons why they would want our funding uh, versus like Equip or NRCS cost share or other funding sources. One of the reasons is that some some of these landowners weren't able to get NRCS cost share money because the cost share dollars ran out or that year um, certain BMPs weren't the priority of some of the cost share funds and things like that. Some other landowners just don't want to accept um, government subsidies and they will accept private collaborations and private funding but they don't want to take um, what they perceive to be a handout from, from the government to run their operation. So um, we have a mix of different reasons why landowners um, are seeking funding from us. Also, our, our contracts are very um, clear, and they are simple, and they're to the point. So landowners can read our contract, they understand what it says, and they're able to move forward with us in a confident way. Uh, the project was featured in the Wall Street Journal last year with one of our landowners. Um, and um, we also have a YouTube video. And I would recommend if you've got five minutes of spare time to look at the YouTube video. It not only details on the ground footage with our landowners, um, but it describes water quality trading more generally. So if you want to ramp up on some of the details on how water quality trading works, you can watch this for three minutes and pretty much you get, you get the deal. So an example project here, this is a, a landowner that we funded in Indiana. Um, he had a, a milk house where 
his um, his cows would hang out in his barn and then come out to feed, and it was really muddy and and it was dangerous actually for the cows themselves and for the landowner who would have to go out there and maintain the cows. Um, when I was out on this farm and, and stepped in the mud, it was, you know, your boot gets sucked off, basically. It's hard to walk. It's hard to move. Um, so we funded something called a heavy use protection area or a HUAP um, that you install a ground cover. Um, uh, it's a um, it's a fabric layer, and then it's overlaid with rock and and so forth on there. So now the the cows can walk around on there without slipping, and the landowner can get out there to maintain things. And best of all for us, uh, that landowner scrapes off the manure from the cows, puts it in the manure storage pit, and then it's not running off into the water. The manure can compost and he reapplies it to the field at the appropriate time um, to use as organic fertilizer for his field. So this was a, a great project um, that we've done and we have uh, we have you know 60 plus of these um, that have been installed, not just heavy use paths but cover crops, cattle exclusion fencing, milk house ways. We installed a treatment wetland on a couple of um, downstream of milk houses. For getting credits, um, the landowners need to be doing something beyond uh, what they're required to do by law and beyond what their current practices are. So that's our called our agricultural baseline. So they have to do something additional to either what's required by law. So if they're not meeting what's required by law, we don't give them credit just to get up to the legal requirements. They have to get there. And if they're already doing everything great on their farm, unfortunately, we can't then retroactively give them credit for past action. It has to be additional to what they're doing now. So we have pretty rigorous um, audit cycle that goes to verify the ag baseline conditions, including a five-year look back on farm practice history. We pull aerial photography from the, from the, the states um, that goes back also three to five years. So we look at what's been going on on that farm. So if they want to install a heavy use pad, we can use the aerial photography to say is it there or not. And then of course there's the farmer um, attestation which um, says whether or not the practice was additional. We have a pretty, it's a, you know, this is a big project. So um, I try to roll it up to the, um, as simple as possible, but underneath it, there's a lot of steps here that go from raising private money to getting it to the state agency all the way to the farmer, generating the credit. You know, you have to outreach to producers, you do an RFP that's an unbiased RFP, you have to install the practice that has to be verified with boots on the ground, and then eventually your credit can be recognized, and then it moves to the credit transaction side. And then the other half of the project starts after the credit's generated. You still have to sell it. Um, and the credit transaction side, we're, we're focused on this pretty heavily right now because um, all of my funding is installed now on farms. All the funding for farmers has, has gone out the door at this period in the pilot. So now we're focused on the transaction side, which is getting buyers to the table and we've already had transactions, but now I need to really um, test out uh, how many credits am I going to be able to sell. We have a full watershed model um, that backstops the program, the warmth model. Um, and this is a full calibrated model. And we have the calibrated, we have these calibrated huck fours posted to our website. This was a, a pretty significant effort to calibrate the warmth model for all the hucks that you see colored there, um, which is the only places that we're transacting credits at this time. Um, and so if you have a need for a mechanistic watershed model and don't have the funds to calibrate it, you're welcome to use the, the version that we've calibrated already on our website. Um, the way that our credit transactions work is that based on this watershed model, um, the trade ratio between where our buyers and sellers are, meaning that um, 
If you reduce 10 pounds at the edge of your farm field, it may only be worth five pounds at your buyer location, depending on how far your buyer is and what the waters are doing between your buyer and seller. This warrant model calculates exactly what your pounds are worth at your buyer location. And that's what the buyer can use towards their permit limit um, and apply towards the NPDES permit. So this is the this is the first project in the country that where we link a mechanistic, fully calibrated watershed model to um, to actually transact each credit. Each transaction is linked to this model to calculate exactly what the credit is worth. And this took an enormous amount of work. In fact, um, we just published last summer the only peer-reviewed paper that looks at a scientific way to um, estimate, it's called the attenuation coefficient, or if you've heard of water quality trading, the other simple way to say that would be your trade ratio. Um, and so we have the only peer-reviewed paper that I know of right now um, in environmental science and technology to describe uh, what we did there. So just a little bit more on kind of the documentation piece of our project. So um, one of the focus areas when we started this program was how do you know that your credits are real? How do you know that they're additional, that the farmer is doing what they're supposed to, that the credits that you're applying towards your permit is just as good as installing a technology at the plant? That's a very important question and, you know, and is the right question in my view to be asking on a water quality trading program because if you're going to use these credits to meet your permit requirement at your plant, there has to be confidence that um, your alternative approach in water quality trading is as good or maybe better than installing a technology at the plant. So we focused on this quite a bit. Um, in the project, and um, I'm going to show you a, a series of slides that just kind of show our documentation, and this is all public view documentation. So for every individual project, we have the Soil and Water Conservation District at the county level. They go out to the farm and they do boots on the ground. They have a before picture and an after picture that are date stamped. So this is what it looked like before, here's what it looks like after, and behind this picture there's a, there's a full document that signed and dated and everything that said they did this field visit. Now that's just the county level. Then the state ag agency acts as our third party verifier. So the state ag agency then goes boots on the ground, they look at the project, um, they look at the farm practice history information. They also have pictures that they have to take and post. And they have a pretty extensive verification form. They have to talk to the landowner. They have to determine if any variation occurred between the project that they said they were going to do and what they actually did. And then we, we can update the credit calculation based on that. And then the, the permitting authority have to sign off that from their view, they review everything from their desk. They say from a desk review, we have looked at all the farm practice history information. We've looked at the SWCD install report, the credit verification report from the ag agency, and we either agree or disagree that these credits are real and valid for meeting a permit limit. Um, and so then it's only after the permit agency certifies that the credits are then released for transaction. Um, based on the number of credits that the permit agency says are good, then EPRI then takes 10% of all those and moves it into a reserve pool, meaning that if a project fails, so let's say that a farmer decides that they don't want to do it anymore. Or a really good example is we installed a milk house management system, but then they sold all their milk and cows. Uh, something like that, right, where we installed a project, but it's really not providing the nutrients for whatever reason. Then you can go into your reserve pool to maintain the program as being whole. 
Upper retires 10% of the credits voluntarily for the public benefit. 10% of all our credits are retired for the public benefit outright because uh, we're a nonprofit. Our projects have a public mission requirement. Um, so we do that outright. So 80% of all the credits uh, are then uh, moved forward to be transacted. When that happens, they're posted on our online credit trading registry. This registry is a rigorous accounting um, platform. Every pound of, of nitrogen, every pound of phosphorus has a serial number. You can only transact at one time. Um, and there's links here where you can see the entire workflow that I just showed you. So every pound, you can see before and after pictures of those farms. You can see the, the opinion of the ag agency and the permitting agency in the public view. So anywhere you are, this is the only project that I know of in the world that provides that kind of visibility and access for audit. When, you sell, or when we sell credits, uh, the buyer can get a purchase receipt. And it has all the information. It shows your HUC 4. It shows to your HUC 10 level where the credits come from. And that's as tight as you can get where the farmer is located. So we don't show the farmer name and address. Uh, there's personal information in there that um, is not appropriate to put in the public domain. Um, but you can get to the HUC 10 level. And then one thing I want to point out here is the ancillary benefits. And this is something that we've done a lot of work on because as you install a compliance, it's fundamentally an offset program. Water quality trading is fundamentally for offsets. If all you do is offsets, you're not really advancing the ball on long-term watershed sustainability because your your fundamental thing is the offset discharges that are gonna be happening at the point source site. However, in the process of setting up this program, we saw many opportunities to look for that uplift. Where can we get a little bit of ecological uplift, still make the program viable so that you're not just offsetting, but now, your program can contribute to the long-term sustainability of the watershed. So we track these uh, uh, ancillary benefits uh, for every farm. Is it carbon, pollinator, soil health, erosion? What are the ancillary, we also do uh, farmer health, animal health, and well-being. What are the ancillary benefits that you can just put a little bit more money into? So if we got a proposal that said, I want to plant this buffer strip, we could call up the landowner and say, okay, can you use a seed mix that supports pollinators? And we would do it back and forth to see, okay, you're going to do this anyway. Could you modify it a little bit and sometimes for no additional cost and get additional ancillary ecological or social benefits? So that's something that we spent time on and we had um, one of the objectives of doing the pilot program was to look at if you're going to do all this and set up all this work, um, what can we do to get a little bit more benefit? So we transacted the first credits um, a year ago um, on March 11, 2014, to Duke Energy, Hoosier Energy, and American Electric Power. Um, and these, all these companies purchased the credits and retired them immediately for public benefit. Um, it was a demonstration for them to test out this whole cash credit cycle of the program. They developed comfort in how this project worked. They saw the credits move into their accounts, and now if they need those credits for permit compliance down the road, they have experience in the program. Um, also, they received immediate business benefit right off the bat through um, reporting the credits in their sustainability reports and posting to their websites and such. When they purchase the credits, you can see them in their accounts. Uh, you can, as a public citizen, it's posted in the public domain. You can see exactly how many credits they got and from which farms and so forth. Um, and there was extensive media coverage, uh, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, et cetera. Um, so the project is, um, has gotten a lot of coverage. 
And now what we're setting up for is the first public credit auction. So the last transactions that we did was um, we, needed, we needed a few buyers to come forward and test it. Now we we're looking for a bigger set of buyers from more industries to come to a public auction, meaning that you're going to sit at a computer and um, put bids in for what you want the credits at. So you'll bid, for, you know, ten dollars. Somebody else will say, "Oh, I really want those. I'm going to bid eleven dollars." And you go back and forth at this auction, and it's stimulating a supply and demand driver for your credit price. So rather than me telling you, I need $10 a pound to recover costs, say, well, my floor price is $10 a pound, but how much are you willing to pay, really, uh, based on supply and demand? And the buyers will, in, in some ways, have to compete with each other. It's going to be in New York City in the New York Times building. Um, and again, this round of credits is, um, these credits are going to be retired for the public benefit. So it's one of the, one of the criteria that EPRI has at this point in the project, that the credits are used towards um, public stewardship. So we still have not tested the, what the demand is going to be for compliance credits directly towards an NPDES permit. But that will be something that we do in the future. And part of that is, is also um, due to timing that we're largely waiting for these three states to promulgate numeric nutrient criteria. But those uh, permit buyers will be a very important uh, driver for this program when that happens. So why buy credits now? You can document and register these these credits, quantified units to offset supply chain impacts. So we're not saying that pay me to see what I can do around your supply chain. I'm saying pay me for documented, verified, approved by state agencies with serial numbers assigned credits for your supply chain. But then you can go and report. You can tell very compelling stories about how you supported a, a pilot program to meet corporate sustainability efforts. Um, from a compliance side, um, you can use these credits even now to meet a supplemental environmental project obligation, so a step obligation. Um, and then three states have also um, provided consideration for flexible compliance schedules for those um, companies that participate in the program proactively now before they are using the credits towards their permit limits. And then socially, of course, you gain experience in the only interstate trading program. Um, you support the local farmers in agriculture. And that's something that a lot of companies are needing to demonstrate, that they have a real commitment to supporting their farmers in agriculture from where their companies operate or where their, their suppliers um, are located. So this was one of our first buyers. And talking about how the water quality credits fit into a broader sustainability strategy. Um, this is the Vice President of American Electric Power. And he said, there's potential from a broader societal basis to achieve ancillary benefits from a credit trading program that go beyond just our power plants. The fact that EPRI's created an opportunity for our company to contribute to on-the-ground improvements that have been confirmed through rigorous audit and oversight gives us an entirely new option for meeting our broader sustainability targets. So we're kind of taking a program that fundamentally is compliance-based and compliance-driven and testing out this space of can we get buyers to the table because the potential pool of buyers to meet corporate sustainability goals is large. And if we can sort of show that the program is useful for both sustainability corporate buyers as well as permit buyers, it just strengthens the long-term viability of the program. And this is, I just dropped this slide in. I, I won't read the whole thing, but aside from this program at EPRI, I also run and manage um, all of our sustainability research at EPRI. And I work, um, I'm on deck often to make the business case for voluntary actions. 
And it's a pretty compelling business case that we know that companies that are sustainable or have this reputation of being sustainable are financially outperforming their counterparts. They have lower corporate risk, and they certainly have new business opportunities compared to their non-sustainable peers. So I have a whole, I actually have an entire hour slide deck on this one slide, the deeper kind of research on this point, but I just dropped in the one roll up here for this for this presentation. Okay, so who gets to participate in our upcoming auction? Um, you can be a nonprofit, you can be an individual, you can be a for-profit. If you're a publicly traded company, the threshold, you have to be willing to spend $10,000 to be able to get in the door. That's your ante, basically. Um, or $2,500 for individuals, nonprofits, and municipalities. Um, just in case anybody on the phone has seen me give a presentation recently, those two thresholds just went down. It used to be 20K for publicly traded companies, 5,000 for individuals. We got a, a fair amount of feedback that said, hey, you know, in this first auction, you might consider lowering the threshold for participation. And we did that. Um, so that's what's reflected there. And then we have um, interest uh, and support from uh, the former deputy administrator of EPA, Bob Purchaseppi. He's given us um, incredible uh, recognition in this project. And um, he also provided a support letter for the project receiving the United States Water Prize. This is just a, an infographic. This is for kind of uh, water quality trading 101. This is how it works and, you know, how nutrients uh, credits are, are created and so forth. And I would suggest um, if you have a few minutes to check out the project website. We do a lot of work to maintain this website so that it's up to date. Um, and, uh, and we have the YouTube video on there that can ramp you up pretty quickly as far as what's going on.